welcome now to video five. It is part of our Above Down Inside Out series. In the previous video, we were having a look at the number one myth that ultimately causes people to become sick, to become unwell, and that is the presumption of feeling fine means that you're healthy. That is simply put not true, as we discussed. And at the end of that video, we started to mention this idea that you need to be able to learn how to listen to your body because that then is the number one cause of health. It is when you are able to take those little signs, those little symptoms, give it proper context and be able to take appropriate action proactively rather than being reactive, waiting until you hit that 50, 60, 70 percent loss of function to do anything. The caveat here is actually knowing what you are aiming to pay attention to. And unfortunately, ever since we're little kids, we are told various things in terms of what we should or shouldn't want to do. We don't want to be a hypochondriac. We don't want to be annoying our parents or somebody else or our spouse later on with every single odd issue that we might experience. And so we get very, very good at being able to dismiss these signs and symptoms, attributing them to nothing. Some of the most common things that people will say to me when they first are coming into my practice for care, they said, I thought it would go away or I didn't think that it was that bad. So in the subtleness, the subtleness in the way that your body is going to try to communicate to you, if you can at least understand what some of these early warning signs are, that's going to help you, not just in your recovery, but also to prevent relapse so that you can stay out of the pain cycle. So let's have a little look and see what's actually involved here. We're going to start up at the top, again, presuming that 100% health that we are all born designed with. So in the beginning, and keep in mind that especially as little kids, we may not necessarily have the ability to communicate to our parents, mom, dad, this is what I am feeling. This is what the problem actually is. And so, yes, think of it through the lens of a child, but even right now, think of it in terms of you as the grown adult. So the first level where you will oftentimes be having your body communicate to you is just that intuitive that intuition, that internal sense. And one of the most common places it shows up is in your mood. So there are times, there are moments, as I'm sure we all experience, myself included, where we are not being the person who we would ideally want to be. As opposed to operating from our higher centers of the brain, that cortex, we are letting the amygdala, the emotional part, and then we're letting the medulla, the survival part, run the show. And what does it do? Usually it creates a little bit of chaos. And especially, who do we take it out on? We take it out on the people who are closest to us, whether that's our spouse, our children, or our parents. Now, yes, of course, hormones are absolutely going to play into this, but we're talking about moodiness in the absence of known something else that would actually cause it. A person is feeling moody, and they can probably identify it, and there's no known reason why. This is a very important concept that I want you to understand. Again, a principle of health and well-being, and it is simply put this. Nothing happens in your body without a reason. Everything is cause and effect, causing effect. So if you're experiencing something, there's obviously an underlying reason for it. Now, truth is, we don't always know what that underlying reason is, but we're just talking right now at an intuitive level. If you're feeling your mood is just off and you're not sure why, pay attention to that. That means there's most likely some kind of imbalance going on. And as we talked about, that imbalance could actually be coming from any number of areas of your life where the problem is, isn't always where the problem shows up. Second thing to look for is simply put brain clarity. How well are you able to communicate? How well are you able to express yourself? Is your brain functioning on all cylinders 
Or is it like the computer has all of the programs running all at once, cluttering the background, decreasing your processing capacity, and as a consequence, you say, I'm just not able, I'm not as sharp as I normally would be. And again, it's an apparent contrast. You're noticing that. And you're probably going to pay attention to, well, why would that be? Okay, maybe it was because I didn't sleep well. Maybe it was because I was eating something and I wasn't supposed to. So if you can pinpoint what the source of these intuitive senses are, wonderful. You're listening to your body. If you're not, then that's going to require a little bit more of that further investigation. The next one at this highest intuitive letter is the simply put, je ne sais quoi. I don't know what. I'm not feeling myself. I'm, I don't know what it is, but something is just intuitively not right. And we're talking about a persistent sense here. You see, any and all of us, we are going to experience different dips and blurbs over the course of our days, our weeks, our months, our lives. That's normal. The question is, is when the exception starts to become a pattern or where it starts to show up more frequently. So one of the best rules of thumb that I can ever give any person in terms of principle is what's known as the three-day rule. What is the three-day rule? It's that your body, when you are experiencing various issues, odd bits and blurbs, should be able to resolve whatever that underlying issue is within 72 hours. So day one, day two, day three. If the problem is not getting better, on day three, that's a sign that something abnormal is going on. Now, of course, if you are experiencing what you perceive or could be a potential medical emergency, something that could kill you or cripple you, please don't delay. We're talking instead about those low-grade signs and symptoms. And this is going to show up in terms of your body function, as we'll show you in just a, a little moment here. But three-day rule. If the problem is not actually getting better within three days, that's a sign your body is not actually working at that highest level. Now, in addition to that, there is also the three week or the three times rule that I also advocate. This is where your body seems to be going in cycles. There is a recurrent problem that, yeah, your body seems to be able to resolve it within a day or two, but it keeps coming back and you have observed it over a period of time. Once as an accident, twice as a coincidence, three times as a pattern. So if you are noticing you're having these recurrent cycles of moodiness with no apparent cause, you're noticing that from time to time your brain is just not firing the way that it should be. Or where you're feeling those times where just something is not right. I'm feeling flat. I'm feeling off. I don't know why. That's the way that our body communicates to us at that highest level. Again, it should not be the kind of thing where suddenly you start setting off all the alarm bells and you need to start taking drastic actions. What it means is it means that those are the signs and the symptoms where you need to do a reflection and a check in. Okay, if this is happening, what is the most likely reason for that and what do I need to be able to do in order to resolve that issue? Listening to those very subtle signs. Now, as we've said, we get very good with the busyness of our life. or not wanting to be a burden on somebody else of learning to be able to ignore that and soldiering on doing the very best that we can. And unfortunately, then the, what's going to do is it's going to drop us down to the next level. And this is where it's going to start to affect our daily functions, our daily performance. This doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually having pain or other symptoms at this point. Then that is very, very important to understand. You're just noticing you're not performing at your top level. If you're an athlete or if you've done sports of any kind, you'll know that you have some days where everything is clicking and then other days where it's just not happening. That's kind of what we're referring to right here. So one of the first examples is your stress capacity or your stress adaptability. You see, at any given moment of time, we're all able to handle a certain amount of stress 
that's going on in our life. And we're going to have a video later on in the series where we're going to look a little bit more at exactly what we're referring to. But you can appreciate that if you are dealing with all kinds of different issues all at once from every angle, that that is going to lower your stress processing capacity. And as a consequence of that, you can find yourself getting triggered by the most innocuous of things. Again, it's usually the people who we love and who we are closest to, and they are not what the actual source of the problem is. Nevertheless, that's where it oftentimes comes out. So again, if you are finding that you are very easily getting triggered and or overwhelmed, you're simply not able to handle all the stuff that life is throwing at you, especially if I'm struggling with normal daily functions. It's like, wait a minute, I don't have all kinds of obscene things going on here, and yet I'm not able to cope with all of this. That's a sign of decreased stress capacity. Something is going on. You need to pay attention to that. The next one then is your overall energy. So simply put, do you have the energy to do all of the daily tasks that you need to do? Or do you need the continuous caffeine hit, the continuous, the continuous sugar hit, the continuous stimulation just to make through so that you can collapse, not sleep, recover well, wake up the next day just as flat as you were before and repeat the cycle over and over and over, running yourself into the ground on fumes. Low energy is a sign your body's not working at that peak performance. Something is amiss. And the last one at this particular level is simply put the ease and your ability to do the different kinds of things that you need to do over the course of life. We've already said that if you're an athlete, you understand the concept of peak performance. You train so that you can perform at game time at the highest level. Nevertheless, there are certain days where your coordination is just not quite as sharp as you normally expect it to be. Things are just that little bit off. You don't know why. We all have days like that, and in part, that's part of a, a normal cycle that does go on in the body. But again, we're talking about persistent challenges, persistent physical limitations. The major issue that people have here is they attribute their decreased function to quote unquote normal aging. Oh, I'm not able to do the things that I used to do and it's because I'm older. Now again, yes, there is going to be some truth to that. Nevertheless, there are still plenty of examples of people who in their 50s, 60s, 70s, because they've made changes, they are functioning actually at a much higher level than they were in their 20s, 30s, and their 40s. So yes, we don't want to dismiss the significance of chronological age, but remember that it's the environment and how we take care of our bodies that's the biggest factor, our biological age. And so we want to be sure that we are still able to do all of the things at the highest possible level and not simply attribute it to getting older, especially if you can notice that there is an imbalance one side more on your body than another. Yes. We all have dominant hands, dominant legs, all that sort of stuff, but that should only account for about 10% of the overall specialization one side to the other. So if you're starting to notice significant imbalances, significant decreases, one side compared to the other, again, that's a sign something in your body is not working right, even if it is not yet causing you pain. This is also very important when we're going to be looking at a person's posture. Posture is a reflection of your inner reality. So when we start to see people deviate, shift off to the side, something like this, their head turns, one hip shifts like that, they put more weight or your shoes wear down more on one side versus the other. Again, all of these are the early signs that something is not operating in your body the way that it should be. And it's inevitably going to lead to problems unless you act and prevent rather than wait for cure. Now the third level down, and this is where you're starting to get around that 40% loss of function. Again, you're not necessarily having pain and other problems just yet. Again, you feel fine, you're healthy, right? Not necessarily. 
this is where it's going to start influencing some of those daily functions. And one of the most important ones is our immune system. You see, yes, we are going to go through seasonal fluctuations, spring, winter, fall in particular, where the temperature goes up and down, up and down. And so our body has to continuously you know, maintain that. And that's what we typically think of as flu season. But the reality is, is there is no such thing as flu season. Influenza, viruses, all that sort of stuff, they are all around us at all times. It's when our immune system's function is depressed or when it's having to work harder because you've got more stress in your life or because you're having to adapt to temperature that you're more likely to become sick and to express those particular kinds of symptoms. In fact, most of the symptoms associated with a person being sick, it's actually not because of the virus. It's because that's what your body needs to do in order to kill it. So what is it going to do? It's going to turn your thermostat up. Why? Because bacteria and viruses don't survive when the temperature goes up. It's going to make you feel very flat, no energy. Why? Because your body intelligently is diverting your energy that you would normally do all of your daily stuff into healing and repair. And that's also why you're tired. Because guess what? When does the best healing happen? It happens when you're sleeping, not when you're awake. Now, nevertheless, when your body mounts an effective immune response, what did we say? Three-day rule. Your temperature is going to go up. You're going to feel most dreadful for a few days, and then you start to feel better. Now, yes, that function may go down a little bit as you are getting older. Sometimes I use the example of whatever your first number in your age is. So, for example, if you're 50 years old, all right, it might take you still five days. The point being is if you are either A, the person who is always and continuously getting sick, or B, you are experiencing some kind of unwellness, you say you're fighting a virus, but man, I can't shake that one. That one seemed to last two weeks, three weeks, way longer than it's supposed to. What that suggests is that suggests that your immune system was not able to make an appropriate, strong response to be able to deal with it right off the bat. And in terms of immunology, it overlaps significantly with your endocrine system, that is your hormones, and also your neurological system, which is your wiring, which only controls and coordinates everything in your body. So point being is if you're noticing that you've got decreased immune function, this is also strongly associated that something is wrong with your physiology and also with your neurology that requires investigation. But again, we oftentimes attribute that to being normal. Why? Because there's not necessarily pain associated with that. Similar here, then, is going to be healing and tissue recovery. Again, as we get older, yes, it does take a little bit longer for injuries to be able to heal. However, if we are noticing spontaneous bruising or that, you know, we've had an injury but it is just not healing the way that you would expect. And again, think of this as a contrast. When you were very young or when you see little kids, if they've got an injury, they usually bounce back from that relatively quickly. If you have had whatever going on, and this also applies to if you ever need surgery for any reason, but that healing, it's like you're just having complication after complication after complication, and it's taking way longer than it was supposed to. The reason for that is because the soil itself, the framework with which your body is able to make these healing and repairs is some way compromised. You remember what we had said earlier. And that is that your body should be capable of healing within reasonable periods of time. And if you've got these ongoing challenges here, it's usually a reflection of what your health and your lifestyle was before the episode, the event that went into it. In other words, let's say you've got two people who go in the hospital for the same condition. One has been taking care of their health. The other one hasn't. Based on probability, this person is going to have a much more favorable outcome than this person because of all of those lifestyle factors. So tissue and healing repair, again, another very important sign.
And the last one is where you start to experience little blips on your radar. You attribute them to nothing, but they are one-off abnormal episodes. This could be a little sudden episode of a headache, and you never get headaches. And there is no such thing as a normal headache. Think about this one here, if you would, for an example. You might be familiar with the idea of a sciatica, what people commonly talk about as being low back pain, where it's radiating down into your legs, into your foot. And if it's severe enough, people are thinking, oh, dear, I need surgery. But usually surgery is not the primary first portal of entry. In other words, radiating pain because of a neurological issue going down to your leg. Now, what's a headache? Headache is irritation of either the nerves or the connective tissue around your brain. There is no such thing as a normal headache. It means that your head, your neck, and your brain are under distress. And what do we say? Ah, oh, it's just a normal headache. I just put up with it, take like a little bit of medication. No, 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 no. Headaches are a sign something is wrong. We should not be ignoring that ever. Now, the same thing goes then if we have other blips that show up on the radar. And again, we may not identify with things just yet, but we have a one-off episode where our lower back was really, really killing us, or we had a foot problem, or we had a hip problem, or a hand, or we had a sudden episode of heartburn, or we had a sudden episode of vertigo, or we had a sudden digestive episode. And remember, as we've said, one-offs, okay, is one-offs. But if then we start to have more of these blips start to show up on our radar, okay, yeah, weird, I had an episode like that, you know, three weeks ago, or I had one six months ago, or okay, yeah, this happened again last year, that if these little blips start showing up here, you may not yet be to the point of full-blown pathology, but this is kind of the last call that your body makes in terms of speaking to you where it's relatively quiet, relatively manageable. If you ignore it, that one step farther, bang, it is on. And that's then where we get to the pain, the pathology, the overt issue, something is wrong and I need to take action. As is often said, there are two great motivators in life, inspiration and desperation. And unfortunately, for most people, they wait until desperation calls them and propels them to take action. Inspiration, on the other hand, is a little bit harder because it does take that little bit of foresight, that little bit of discipline, and that knowing that you want to prevent rather than have to wait for cure. And it also requires that we know what those subtle little signs are that our body is communicating to us. The choice then that we have is we can listen either when our body is just communicating, okay, hey, a little whisper, you may want to do something about this, or if we want to wait until it is screaming at us, it's too late, we need to do something. Now, remember what we had said also, it's that your body continues to work and continues to heal up until your last breath. So even though, yes, you might be at the point of crisis already, it doesn't mean that you have to live with that forever. Your body's going to heal. You may not be able to get all the way back to 100% where you were, but you get as close to where you possibly can. And as you go through that healing process, and in particular, it usually takes time. Remember what we've said before as a general rule of thumb, one month for every year that the issue was there, whether or not it was causing you problems or pain or anything like that, we have to be real about these things, but that it should also be abundantly clear that you are going in the right direction within six to 12 weeks. As you are then going through this healing process, what can you expect? Well, you can expect that you are actually going to work your way back through these previous levels. So characteristically, and not always, it's because again, the doctor does not have the ability to control this is the sequence that you are going to be feeling better. Even you don't get to consciously control that. Remember again, that's your innate intelligence, those internal repair mechanisms that's controlling and coordinating all that function. So you may say, yes, I want this symptom to go away first, but your intelligence says, sorry, dude, 
this is priority. We need to work on this. Don't worry, we'll get to that later. And that's because, do think about this for a sec. Even if you're not feeling that you have a problem with your lungs, you feel that you have a problem with your arm or your hand. Which one is your brain going to say is more important? Well, you can live without an arm and a hand. You're not going to last very long without your lungs. So if there's internal repair that needs to be done, that oftentimes is going to happen first. And that can be very frustrating because we just want to feel better. But that's why it's important, again, to respect this is the way that healing has to occur. It's the natural law. It happens no other way. Now, as we're saying, what you'll notice as you're going back through these healing and repair cycles, you'll notice that you're going to go back through these different things. So oftentimes, even though you may still have physical pain, physical aching, or episodes where things do pop up, it's not uncommon where you will notice that you're overall, you're sleeping better. You're not getting sick near as often. You have more energy. You're not as irritable for no known reason. And you may not always notice that. It might be your spouse, your kids, your parents, the people who are actually closest to you. They just remark, there's something different about you. These are all the signs then as you are learning and as your body is waking up and you're becoming more of that person who you were born and designed to be. And what it also means, and this is the opportunity to stay out of the pain cycle. Remember, the pain cycle is where you fall back into that myth that I feel fine, so I must be healthy. Okay, well, I'm out of pain. I can keep going back doing all the same stuff. Guess what? You're going to end up right back where you started. But that as you keep going up and up and up and up and up and up, up the ladder, you will start to be able to listen more to those subtle signs of what your body has previously experienced. And if you listen to them saying, mm, I'm feeling a little bit flat, uh-oh, something must have gone awry. I'm starting to go back to where I was before. I don't want to do that, so I need to take the appropriate action now in order to make that kind of change. So in that particular regard, pain, problems, dysfunctions in the body are not always bad things. If we are cognizant enough to listen and to take appropriate action so that we can prevent relapse. So again, even if you do find yourself in this particular zone right now, again, that does not have to be a forever kind of thing. And by taking the right action, that can actually help and be very important to prevent future relapse. It's part of the learning process. Of course, we would always do things differently in the past if we knew what we know now. The best thing that we can hope is that we learn through our individual experience, but also then too that we can share our experiences and that wisdom with the people who we care and love the most so that they ideally do not have to learn the same way. Now, sometimes the question is, well, out of all of those different categories, remember, eight areas of your life, five manifestations of your physical, uh, excuse me, of your health, and then the three areas of stress, the physical, chemical, emotional. Where do you need to focus your time and attention? Now, this is not an absolute rule. Again, we're just talking a few principles right here. But I nevertheless want to give you a few rules of thumb that will help where you need to look first. Remember, you're doing an inventory, and so you explore into that, and then it may lead you to other places, but this is usually the best place to start. So the first one, in terms of if you are having a problem with your stress adaptability, remember we talked about your stress capacity is reduced. Most likely, it's going to show up in terms of a sense of overwhelm or a sense of constantly being triggered. Something is going on in that arena where you're not properly managing your ability to deal and to compensate with stress. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about what stress is and what it isn't in a later video, but that general little bit of information should be able to help you out for right now. The next one then, sleep. Sleep is typically going to show up if you are feeling constantly fatigued, needing stimulants to get through the day or if you are noticing diminished oxygen. Now, there's a couple of things on diminished oxygen. Number one is if you have a spouse or somebody else there in bed with you, if you snore or 
stop breathing in micro bits over the course of night, guess what? You are not getting sufficient oxygen. And you can test these things with what's called a pulse oximeter or pulse oximetry. It's a little device you can put on your finger. It measures your oxygen saturation. And if you see that that number is going down, oftentimes it means that there is something that is impacting your sleep. And you're probably going to have to do a little bit of an exploration there because that can involve breathing, that can involve jaw, that can involve neurology, that can involve diet, a lot of different bits and pieces. But if you're noticing the constant fatigue, something usually is a bit off in your sleep. And as much as people like to think, oh, okay, well, I might just be able to sleep in a little bit on weekends. For some reason, it doesn't quite work that way. Your best bet is if you ever want to improve the quality of your sleep, you need to go to bed earlier, not sleep in later. Try it. Nutrition. If and when your nutrition is off, you're going to notice, quote unquote, symptoms of indigestion and or this is going to manifest in terms of your body mass, your body weight. You see, when it comes to the question of diet and exercise, your exercise really has very little to do, maybe about 20% with your overall body shape. We gave an example earlier of somebody who would be doing exercise 30 hours a week. They can still have digestive issues. They will still be carrying a little bit too much weight around them. They just won't be able to shed all of that. Most of the issues that we have in terms of obesity is going to be a factor of malnutrition and that we are putting something into our body that should not be in there. So if you're looking at a dietary something or a weight management something, as important as exercise is, diet is actually more important. You most likely need to look there. In terms of, well, how do I know if I need exercise? This has to do with your strength, your flexibility, and your ability to do the different kinds of things that you actually want to do in life, irrespective of what your body shape might be. So, for example, in triathlons, there's what's known as a Clydesdale class. Clydesdale, these are typically the people that are very, very big. And you would almost think it's like this person has no business doing a triathlon yet. They do it. So again, demonstrating that physical ability and weight are not necessarily the same kinds of thing. So this has to do with your strength and your performance. You might remember something we had mentioned in a previous video. It's that osteoporosis is a process that's going to happen. We've already lost 70% of your muscle mass, excuse me, your bone mass. And usually that's happened because you first lost your muscle mass. And why did you lose your muscle mass? Because you weren't exercising and moving your body the right way. Or something else was going on and you were leaching all of your calcium and your mineral deposits back out. Point being is what you need is you need to maintain that physical movement, that physical strength in order to function as well as you possibly can. And when you start experiencing physical limitations, tightness, loss of flexibility, inability to perform daily functions. That's where you oftentimes need to look. The fifth one then, your function. This is when it's going to be manifesting in terms of firstly your posture. Remember what we said before. Posture is an outer reflection of your inner reality, particularly your muscles, your ligaments, and also your nerves. If there's tension that's affecting your neurology, it's going to cause your body to shift like that. And that will inevitably lead to a breakdown, physical breakdown of some part of your body, depending which area is under stress the most. Now, that's going to be the outer physical stuff. But then there's also the inner, because remember, if you've got a disruption of your neurology, it's going to then influence how everything else works. And these are the various different forms of disease. Then. So whether it's the heart, the lungs, the digestive, the reproductive systems. Oftentimes, there's an underlying, underlying neurological reason for that. Now, it's important then to know, is this the difference between the disease or the disease, as we had talked about before? One is the consequence of, sorry, you not doing all of the right things that you need to do. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. 
The other one is you're doing the right things, but it's not manifesting. That's because there's interference to that normal kind of function. That's where then you got to find out what's the source of that interference. Keep doing the good things that you're doing, but then by removing that interference, that then allows that innate intelligence to be able to heal and express, restore that normal function to the highest possible level. So again, this little video here, hopefully is going to give you a few ideas and a few tips in terms of when you need to listen to your body, what does that actually mean? What level are you at? So that you know what the appropriate action is. And then where do you need to look to actually implement and make changes so that you can actually improve the quality of your life, so that you can get out of the pain cycle, so that you can avert relapse, and so that you can stay as close as possible to that highest 100% level that you possibly can. Again, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that, but over a period of time, as you develop those habits, as you develop those different ways of thinking, those different ways then of being, that ultimately leads you to a much better, happier, and healthy place. Good luck with that. Thanks for watching.